Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. I'm going to spend just a few minutes, as Elsa just said, talking about large-scale material flows and cities of the future. We've actually already gotten a couple of questions on cities, so I'm, so I'm happy to, to, to know that it's of interest very, very quickly. So this is the 20th century. This is material extraction from the Earth's crust. So at the beginning of the 20th century, we were extracting materials, fossil fuel energy carriers, 7.4 gigatons. At the end of the 20th century, a little, a little beyond, we were extracting 60 gigatons. This is an enormous um, change, and it's reflective of the building of a variety of things, including cities and infrastructure, because you build cities and infrastructure out of minerals, metals, and, and you then power them, as Jessica noted, uh, with fossil fuels. One thing that came, comes out of that work is that it's very clear that around 1960, when you took that extraction and you analyzed it, how much of it is renewable, how much of it is non-renewable? And around 1960, we went from a decidedly renewable material consumption society to a non-renewable material. And again, that's partly a reflection of you don't build cities out of wood and paper, you build them out of minerals, concrete, um, uh, metals, long life materials. So just a couple, of, just this, this is really more than anything else, just to prompt a really rich discussion. And I hope that we have a really rich discussion because it's the environment, right? It's kind of a fraught issue, right? So this is a portion of the island of Manhattan back in the 1600s. <laughs> That's that same place around 1970. And it took about 300 years, a little more, for 8 million people to be settled in that place. Now let me contrast that with a small fishing village southeast coast of China in about 1984. Population maybe 20,000, 30,000. That's that same place. This is Shenzhen. So an order of magnitude, less time, and 2 million more people, 10 million people. This is historically completely unprecedented. So what we're looking at is um, not only uh, contrast the, or, or supplement the material flows with a population increase. We went from a decidedly uh, n rural, non-urban society and, and world to an urban world. So more than half the peop half people on, on, on Earth now live in cities. And that, that changed. That switched over around 2008. And that's going to continue to increase to about 65, possibly 70% in the next 30 years or so. So I guess I do have a poll here. So um, this poll is, how many people will live in cities in 2050? I see uh, you've already started to, OK, so you've heard my talk before. <laughs> OK, no, I mean, so this is very good that you know that essentially there's a doubling of the urban population. And that's the, that's, that is our future. So the, what we wanted to do on this panel is take you back hundreds of millions of years, billions of years, and then take you some distance into the future. And, and the cities, in, in my work, that's, that's what I do. Cities is uh, what I focus on and in the group, uh, the urban metabolism group here at MIT, which uh, echoing uh, Elsa's point, I would have had a hard time founding that kind of group anywhere else, a super multidisciplinary group. I've had 75 Europe's in the past 18 months, uh, math majors, physics majors, architecture, the full gamut of undergraduates. It's been extraordinary. So the doubling in urban population, um, just by the way, also is happening in the cities, but 90% of it is happening in developing regions. So it's in hap the, the fastest growing cities, the largest increase in population is happening, happening in those cities that are already stressed to deliver the life-sustaining provisions, water, sanitation, power, um, that, that urban residents need. So that 
prompted me a few years ago to go from looking at materials for buildings, and I'm an architect, and as I said, class of 85 here did course four, uh, practiced as an architect, then, then came back into academia, did a lot of work in green buildings, and then decided that we really needed to take a look at cities and the resource intensity in cities. So the, the field is urban metabolism, and it is literally the study of physical flows required to serve the urban economy. So a couple of results, very quickly before we get to the discussion. There's a huge range of uh, resource consumption in the cities today um, across the globe. And you can essentially categorize them in a number of different ways, but let's say just three, three broad categories. In developing regions, if you took everything that the urban resident consumes and you put it in a basket and you weighed it, including the energy carriers, fossil fuel energy carriers, you'd have somewhere around five, maybe 10 tons per capita. So these are cities like Lagos, Nigeria, South, uh, cities in Southeast Asia. In transition urban economies, in transition economies uh, in the, uh, the Eastern Europe, South America, other places in Southeast Asia, 10 to 30 tons per capita consumption. And in the developed world, so in the developed North in Europe and the United States, we are going to 30 to plus 100 tons per capita. So it's an enormous range of consumption. So we decided a few years ago to then launch the, a project to understand the typology of cities, the range of resource consumption. And just so we're very, very clear in doing this five-year project in two minutes, so these are materials that we tracked, the urban consumption of these materials, consumption of these materials in cities, biomass, fossil fuel, total energy, electricity. So this is energy, this is materials, construction minerals and metals, and then industrial metals, metals and minerals total materials, and then CO2 is a proxy for consumption overall. And this diagram is simply just take it as low, medium, and high consumption of these materials and energy carriers. And we developed a typology, and I'm just gonna show you four examples. So cities, Kolkata, Islamabad, Phnom, Phnom Penh, very low consumption, and these are, you know, you can say these are sustainable cities, but these are not models for the future. These cities are sustainable because they're underserving their population. So we don't want to go there in the future. These cities are Japanese cities, and they're unlike any other cities in the world. In fact, we didn't find any one type that was composed of cities only in one country except for Japanese cities. Highly industrialized society and quite low consumption by the population in terms of energy and biomass. Then cities in regions of intense resource extraction, especially fossil fuel and ener fossil energy, uh, extraction have a very, very um, distinct typology of their resource consumption. And then there's all the rest of us in the developed world. And we basically consume at high levels pretty much everything. So the, the, this work is meant to, to understand what is the future, what's the pathway towards sustainability. And just like you hear, there is no single energy technology that will solve our climate problem. There is no single kind of city or single kind of production and consumption a system that will solve our environmental issues. It's really gonna be a cloud of different pathways. And for cities, it's gonna be big, where, where, those, where those cities exist. Tropical cities, northern cities, developing, developed cities. There'll be a number of different models. So the future then looks like this, where today, cities account for two-thirds of global energy, three-quarters of carbon emissions, direct and indirect. The cities are really where it's happening, and also cities are where we might make a huge dent in intelligent planning and some of the technologies that, that Jessica highlighted. And by 2050, there's gonna be a three, three, three-fold increase in urban energy business as usual, and a three-fold increase in urban land area. And so really the, the, the challenge here is to take our very large scale, very complex, the most complex human system that we've developed, understand the challenges and the risks involved in having this highly complex human artifact situated within a climate that has a very, very slight uh, variability, and understand if that variability widens, how are we at risk, and how, are we, how do we move forward to mitigate carbon emissions and then adapt to whatever climate consequences we have. So MIT's commitment in this, 
returning back to MIT, the theme of the day, starting with Raphael, was what, do, what does MIT do in this, in this space? There's an enormous amount, as you've seen, this is a tiny little uh, sampling of the environmental work here at MIT. There's an enormous amount of work ongoing. There's an enormous amount of work to be done. So MIT has launched the Environmental Solutions Initiative. I'm the director. Um, there's some literature out there in the lobby, so I'll just leave it at that. This initiative is essentially MIT's commitment to bring solutions to the environment, just as the Energy Initiative has been important in bringing energy solutions into the real world and engaging our students and our researchers to do that. So thank you very much. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.